Leona. Hi. <laughs> oh, we, I haven't seen you for so long. It's so nice to see your face. Oh, thank you. I know it's been a minute. I, I mean, I can't even think how many years it's been, but it's always nice to reconnect and, and have a good catch up. So you're in Los Angeles, I take it. I am. Yes, I am. How long have you lived out there now? I've had a place here for about eight years. So wow. I've been, yeah, back and forth, back and forth a lot. Um, but I've been here a lot more often recently because of the pandemic and stuff. I did lockdown here. Um, so yeah, it's it's been it's a lovely place to live. It's like sunshine, which is lovely. Um, and my husband's here and I've got all our animals here. So yeah. We're going to chat about animals in a bit, but before that, I know you're coming back over here soon because you're about to go on tour with Gary Barlow, right? I am. Yeah, I am. So I'm excited. I'm a bit nervous, actually, because I haven't been on tour in about five years. Um, and also, I haven't been doing many gigs because of the pandemic. <laughs> so it's a lot. It's a lot. But when I got the opportunity, when I got asked, straight away I was just like yes I want to be out there I want to be on the road I want to be performing again um and I've just been praying that we actually get to do it um because for a while it was looking like it might not happen so luckily everything's on track to happen good and also with Gary who is literally the nicest human on the planet so it couldn't oh. get any better so with that sort of anticipation because you know, I know that feeling to an extent, not that I have to stand on stage and, and sing because I cannot, but sing to lots of people. But, you know, I have those moments where I, I'm anticipating something that feels big or feels a bit scary or there's an unknown element. How do you how do you deal with that? How do you prepare for such a thing? Do you do anything or do you just kind of go with the moment and know you're going to feel nervous? Yeah, it's it's funny because I I kind of have a little cycle that I do. So I kind of know where my mind's gonna go. So I usually get a bit nervous and, and then I try and like make sure everything is as on point as it can be in terms of the preparation that I'm doing. Um, and I kind of just have to kind of go with the flow a little bit, as long as I'm prepared as much as I can be. I know little things are going to happen along the way. The, there are going to be bumps in the road. I just have to anticipate that and not be too crazy when that happens, um, which can be challenging. Um, but, you know, it's just something that I've kind of have to deal with. How does your nervousness manifest? Because I, I too know my own cycles. And if I've got something coming up, if I'm really honest, and I know that I'm anxious about it, Mm. I will be quite irritable and I will probably be a bit of an asshole to live with if I'm really honest yeah, yeah. I do you know what I get emotional right I get really emotional so if I, I'll just like literally just be in my car and like I, usually it's around music like a song will come on and I'll just be like nah! <laughs> <laughs> or I'll be with my husband and like something like really insignificant will happen in a program we're watching and I'll just start crying and I'll know oh okay I'm feeling a bit fragile feeling a bit vulnerable let me just like have a minute um usually involves my husband like talking me off the the ledge and and calming me down and he's a real rock actually in these situations he really 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 helps me and supports me so is mine, even though I treat him like an absolute wally sometimes, because mine, I know that, you know, I think we all start to learn our own cycles and my nervousness definitely manifests a sort of irritation slash anger. But like you said, for some, it can be, you know, um, emotion or you go, you retreat within and you go very quiet. It's really interesting when you start to look at it and then you can start to rectify it. I'm not there yet. You know, I'll rectify it at some point down the line. But at the moment, I just roll with the wave of oh my god I'm doing this again why am I doing this again you know I kind of know it's coming but I I still fall into the trap and then so it's going to be pretty non-stop for you because you've got you've got this tour in the UK with Gary and then giving up for Christmas because I don't know how you feel about this but I see you as kind of the UK's Christmas queen like this is what you've become now whether no. you like that or not that's <laughs> happened no I actually love that it's funny because I put out my Christmas record um about six, seven years ago, we started writing it and I put it out and um, 
it was kind of like a slow burner almost. Um, and then in the past couple of years, it's just become more significant, which has been amazing. And, and I put it out because a lot of my artists that I love, um, like a lot of Motown artists, Stevie Wonder, um, people like that have put out albums around Christmas. So I was inspired by that and wanted to, to do kind of a soulful Christmas album. Um, and the fact that now it's kind of living on a bit is really cool. Um, and I get to, you know, like sing these soulful Christmas songs, which is great. Um, and yeah, just kind of that Christmas for me is a time of year that I just really love because I get to see my family, whether I'm on the road touring, um, away from home a lot, I usually always get to stop and, and see them. So it's a special time of year for me. Um, but obviously last Christmas, I didn't get to see anyone. I, I didn't see my family for a year um, and it was really, really tough. So to now be able to come back and actually come back and have music out there is like just so oh, amazing for me. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think, you know, most people found last Christmas excruciating because of that, you know, not yeah. being able people and and just how strange and painful it was but of course you know so many people out there have that every Christmas where they just hate it it's synonymous with a bad time or they just feel yeah. extremely lonely at that time so it's such a it's such an interesting one isn't it because it's it's either you love it or you really despise it and I I kind of think I've been through all different sort of phases but now I've got kids and they're fully in the sort of Christmas magic it feels it feels very magical again and i and i think music is such a big part of it and you know your song one more sleep you know that is that's become a sort of iconic christmas song and it's funny because so many people try to do a christmas song and absolutely fall flat on their faces it just doesn't happen but you somehow captured that magic in that song how did you do that um thank you yeah it's it's funny because like I, there weren't a lot of Christmas releases around the time that I released the song and, and was recording the song. There'd, there'd been a lot years before and they were becoming those kind of reoccurring Christmas songs that we all love and know now. Um, but um, the guys that I worked on the song with played me like a rough idea of what they were thinking. And it just kind of, it gave me that kind of giddy kid at Christmas feeling. Um, so I knew it was special um, and we injected, you know, real soul into it. Um, we recorded it in a way that um, a lot of the Motown songs were recorded. So it has a lot of warmth to it. Um, my amazing girls are singing on it as well. The BVs who are just outstanding, Kelly and Katie. And just, yeah, just it just felt good. Like, you know, when you just have this feeling when you're recording a song, it just feels good. It felt joyful, it felt uplifting. Um, still had that kind of um, uh, like love kind of heartbreak in it, but just still felt uplifting. So yeah, it felt like a special, a special song. Yeah, you totally nailed it, it's so cool. And then so hopefully you'll be with your family this Christmas? Do they come to you in LA? Do you stay back in the UK? Yeah, so a lot of the times I um, go home to the UK um, and that's what I'll do this year. So after tour, I'll basically be with them and stay with them. And yeah, like like I said, last Christmas was difficult. It was really difficult, um, especially because I had a family member that was really struggling really severely with the pandemic and because I was overseas and couldn't come back I found it so tough it was literally the worst the worst most rubbish Christmas ever and and like you said like Christmas does bring so many feelings and emotions up whether it's you know that you love Christmas and the joy it brings and like you you're, you're with your kids and they give you that newfound um feeling towards Christmas or whether you're lonely and you're heartbroken and you don't have someone. Um, and I, I actually recorded a couple of new songs for this album. Um, and one of them's like a really heartbreaking song, which was kind of inspired by, um, it's a cover called If I Can't Have You, but I, when I was recording it, it made me think of when I had gone through a heartbreak many years ago, with this person that I was so in love with and I spent my first Christmas without them and I was just so lonely, so down. And, 
and just sad. So it, you know, it sums up so much this time of year. Um, but for me this year, I'm so excited about it because I'm going to get to see my family. I'm going to be with them. And yeah, I'm just excited. Oh, I'm happy you're going to be with them. That's that's really special and, and much needed for everyone that this year we get to have a bit of normalcy and just hang out and be the people we love. Because if anything, that's what Christmas has got to be about, you know, 100%. and people yeah. that feel lonely and making sure that they're OK. And, you know, if we can. So that's that's so important that we all do, do that this year. And then so when it comes to cooking, you're you're I've been vegan for only two years, but you're a long term vegan, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've been vegetarian since I was a kid, um, <clears throat> but vegan for about five years, I'd say. Um, it was a very hard transition for sure, because I loved cheese and I loved eggs and all. Eggs. It was eggs for me. The eggs are hard. It's yeah. hard. Um, so yeah, so it was it was a hard transition, but yeah, it's I've I've been vegan now for quite a few years. So we'll do like a nut roast and um, still working on a good uh, Yorkie recipe that works. Um, I think I've got it down now, um, but yeah, it's all all vegan. And you and my share family, that. Well, yeah, I will. I'll, I I'll need share. that. Um, but my mum and dad are as well, mainly plant based. So it's a bit easier as with everyone kind of eating the same thing. Yeah, it's good. And, and nut roast, you've got to get right because it can be ever so dry um, and really like sort of yeah. stick to the to the roof of your mouth. There's a child waving at me. Hello. Oh, Back from school. Um, you can really get stuck to the top of your mouth and it's oh, but if you get a good one, you put yeah. maybe like some sweet potato in or something to give it some moisture. Absolutely perfect. Dreamy. Okay, a bit of sweet potato. Okay, I haven't yeah. tried that. It's funny. Yeah, my husband also is the first person to say something is dry. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, just put some gravy on it then. <laughs> okay. Put some gravy on and shut it. Yeah, just, you just do that. <laughs> I said, I'm cooking. Don't tell me anything about the dry nut roast. <laughs> But look, we've got to talk about veganism because as far as I understand, you've got a vegan cafe in Los Angeles. Yeah, so I actually um, opened up a, a coffee shop. And so I, I would, I like my little morning coffee and I'd go to, you know, Starbucks or, or wherever it is. And I obviously I don't drink uh, dairy milk. So I'd ask for like almond milk or whatever, oat milk. Um, and you have to pay extra for it. And then I would see like the cartons of milk that were wasted, like just thrown, like just built up cartons of milk. And I'd be like, oh my God, we are using so much dairy. And it's just it's kind of scary how much, how much we're using. So I had this idea yeah, to um, open a coffee shop and to not have dairy milk, to just have all plant-based milk and like plant-based pastries. And it was kind of like a little dream of mine. Um, and my husband and I and a partner of ours opened it um, a couple of years ago. Well, three months before the pandemic. Oh, was... <laughs> great. <laughs> great. They're like, okay. <laughs> um, but somehow some way thank the heavens we were able to survive it um and 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 flourish um and now yeah we've got really like good little community down there and and people that really appreciate us us doing it um and and offering something um that's plant-based um because it's not just for people who are vegan it's you know people have intolerances and things like that allergies and stuff so they can get whatever they want there. So yeah, it's I just love really it. good place. Yeah. You've got to open one in London. I want to go. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to. Um, we're actually looking to expand, so we might actually. And how, how do you feel sort of moving into a, a more sort of a, the business side of things? Is that something you enjoy? Do you know what? I always wanted a brick and mortar store because um, my parents actually, they had um, stores when I was growing up. So they had fashion stores and I would go there and work every weekend in the store behind the till like for like 50p an hour. Um, and they would like, it was just, 
it, I don't know, it was so beautiful to see their relationship in that way. They obviously had their family, but then they had a, a business relationship and a partnership. Um, and I'd just grown up around that. So having a little business of my own was kind of like a, a little dream of mine. Um, and it probably comes from that. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It's really funny. I think <laughs> so many people, I'm a bit older than you, but so many people of our generation back in the day had jobs very young in shops. Like my granddad had florists. Well, he had two and then he went down to one. It was called Dandelion. And I, at uh, 12 was working yeah. for him again for like you can have a, a a sandwich at lunch and i'll give you a fiver yeah and be cleaning these eggy pots and like <laughs> crazy we were like kids but yeah yeah good worth ethic, ethic instilled exactly i was the same babe, like 12 years old yeah. in that shop saturdays opening up behind the till um now i think now like i'm looking at my nephews thinking about my like God, I'm like, they're not working at 12. <laughs> no, no. I mean, nor would they even consider it. They'd be like, are you joking? Yeah. No way. I can't even get my kids to do the washing up in our house. <laughs> working in a shop, like, it's never going to happen. That's crazy. And also, I know that your love of animals extends into all sorts of parts of your life and career. And you're also a trustee for a, an animal sanctuary, the Hopefield Animal Sanctuary. Um, how did you get involved in that and, and what kind of drives you to do that work? Um, so I went to Hopefield um, Animal Sanctuary about 10 years ago. I visited there and actually my manager who is from Essex, she would go there as a kid. So it's been there for years. It was kind of a, a little sanctuary. They had a lot of horses, mainly a horse rescue. Um, and she knew I loved animals, so she invited me down one day. And I just fell in love with the place. Um, I met one of the owners, Ernie, who was quite old at the time. He'd have he'd had the place about 27 years. Um, and he was uh, quite fragile and frail. Um, and I just kept going down there, visiting, volunteering, hanging out. And he asked me one day, he said, um, you know, would you be able to continue the sanctuary on? Um, and I said, yeah, of course, you know, of course. And and a, a little while later he passed away. So I took it on um, with some other trustees, his son, um, uh, Nicola, uh, who had been there for years and two of the managers. And yeah, we've kind of just been rebuilding it. Um, it was quite uh, run down when I got involved. Um, there was a lack of funding, uh, there was a lot that, that needed to happen. So we kind of got it to a place where we're sustaining it now. Um, and we have all different kinds of animals, um, lots of horses, uh, lots of farm animals, and all of them are basically rescued from abuse and, and neglect situations. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be quite sad to hear some of their stories. Um, and you know, we've, we've got like one of the oldest horses as well there. She's like 45 years old. I've never met a horse this old, but Should literally be that old. I, I'm I, not used to it. I don't know. He didn't know. I thought horses lived till about late twenties, but this girl is old. Like she's got one eye. She's like a little skeleton. She's so cute. Um, but that's the kind of lives that they have there, you know, um, stress-free, um, a lot of them have been abandoned, you know, or just literally we'll, we'll get people that call us. And the other day it was awful. Someone found a kitten tied in a plastic bag on the side of the street. He had one leg missing. Like it was oh. some of the animals that we get through that it's, it's really, it's really shocking. Um, and you kind of, you know, like how can somebody do this you, you it's it's horrible I just um, don't get but, it like I, the animal cruelty thing just I just don't get it like my parents have just got a new dog they just rescued oh this gorgeous dog called Wilma from the Chinese meat markets so they've been working oh. for like six months to get her flown over and eventually they've managed it and she she landed here this summer and she is considering what she's been through she is the most gorgeous dog she's so chilled out super well behaved she's she's trained so I, i'm imagining she was a domestic pet beforehand yeah. and she loves my parents she's following my dad everywhere and 
my kids, my daughter doesn't love dogs, but she loves Wilma because she's so placid. And it, if you can do it, rescuing a, an animal rather than buying a pedigree pet or whatever is just such a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, that, oh, I love that they did that because the, the, those meat markets, are, it's a lot of, oh, it's, it's horrible yeah. what goes on. So that's amazing that she's rescued and she's probably so grateful as well, like, you know, to, to be there and, and to be saved. And, and that's what I love about Hopefield and being around the animals there. Um, you see this, you can rebuild a trust with an animal that's been abused. And, you know, there is a process that goes into it, but once you see that, it's just such a beautiful thing. Um, and yeah, just being around that for me is just so calming and, just being back in nature, you know, being go, being back in our natural place is, is yeah. important. And having yeah. that relationship, that right relationship with nature, and one of the easiest ways, I guess, is with pets, because if you've got pets, you know that there's, there is a relationship and it's, it's a beautiful, unique relationship, but also extending that to, you know, all of these beautiful animals you're talking about, whether it's horses, farm animals, etc. It's such a lovely thing. And how, how was the sanctuary affected during the pandemic? Because I know obviously, so many charities have been hit so hard because the focus has only been on the pandemic, but there's all these other crises that are happening yeah. globally that are getting just no attention, obviously no government support. And there's a bunch of charities that I work with that have had an extremely tough time, you know, certainly sort of cancer charities because all of a sudden cancer wasn't even being looked at. And, and it's yeah. stuff like this as well, you know, with animal charities, we can't forget about these setups because they, they need, the attention and, the, and they need funding how have you guys coped through it yeah that's been that was really difficult um because animals um sanctuaries and and charities are usually like the kind of last on the pecking order um so our funding went right down like we, we were getting nothing and and obviously like people were worried about what they're going to do, where they're getting their money from, like it, it was a knock on effect. So um, Hopeville got hit really hard. Um, I had to just reach out to a lot of people um, and, and really just kind of garner a lot of support myself. Um, we obviously had like reserves for rainy days, which the pandemic was. So luckily we had um, something to get us through. And actually when we reopened, we had a ton of people visiting. Um, so that was great because that sent more donations our way. So luckily when we were able to open, because it's all outside, we could open a bit quicker. Um, our funding was able to resume, but it was really tough. It, for a minute, we were really, really worried um, that we might have to just close. Um, and that just would have been awful. So it was hard, it was really tough. No, I bet, and because you know the animals there personally, I can't imagine it. And you know, I just really hope that all charities that have been hit and, and are suffering at the moment just get a real influx of, of you know, awareness to them now. We, we certainly need that. And, you know, it's just, when we look at this last 18 months, and it's hard to not talk about it when having a sort of lengthy conversation because it has, has impacted all parts of life you know every part of of life it's affected in some way and it's obviously been such a shit storm for so many people whether it's us individually it certainly mm. we'll all know many people that are still suffering and going through it and not just because of the pandemic there's been so many other issues that have been brought to the surface in this last totally peculiar 18 months and and one of them is, of course, the discussion around race. And I watched your video that you put out last year um, on Instagram, where you were talking about a particularly painful story. You were telling about a shopping trip you had with your dad. And, yeah. you know, I, I sat there um, watching and listening and thinking, this has got to be pretty painful to talk about. Yeah, I'm sure you felt utterly essential for you to to sit and and retell that story to everybody yeah it was like you said like so much happened in this 18 months and you know the world stopped and could really look at what was going on um and if it if it hadn't been for the pandemic what had what the incidents that had occurred with George Floyd and 
all of these incidents that were occurring, these horrific, horrific incidences, wouldn't really have had the kind of microscope on them that they did. Um, and also being, I was in California at the time, um, so it was it was just so prevalent everywhere. Um, there were riots, there were, it, it was crazy here. Um, and, you know, usually I don't, I, I'm quite, a, like, I, I don't, I'm not out there, like, just chatting and away about every single thing. I'm, I'm just not that kind of person. But this affected me so deeply and triggered me in such deep ways that I couldn't help but just express how I felt about it. And, and then I, I spoke about uh, the incident that occurred with me and my dad. And it was just very painful, but something I needed to share um, because it's a real thing that we are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and that, you know, as a person of color, as a black person, as a mixed race person, that we deal with these things every single day. And I think that was just such a, an explosion that happened and very, very, very painful to watch. Um, and just, you know, just such a, it, it was just awful. It was just such a tragedy, a tra tragedy, I can't even speak. <laughs> no, I know, you know, it was, it, you made so many <clears throat> very important points during the video and, and also in the, in the copy that you pasted. And, and that was that it, it's often seen and definitely around that time that this was sort of an American issue. And your point yeah. and your story was very much based in the UK that you and your dad, when entering a shop in London were treated very badly by the shopkeeper um, who then sort of ended up apologizing because she recognized you. And yeah. Yeah. You know, and it and it was that was that was in London. That was, you know, yeah, right near where you were working and living and, and hanging out. And, it, you know, as you said, it's an everyday and local to wherever you are situation. Yeah. And, and it's these these little things that people are like, oh, this, that doesn't happen anymore or that doesn't. But it's a reality. You know, it is a reality. And it was a time for us to all look at what was going on around us and really it was just to say like we just need to be more kind to each other we need to show more love towards each other and and not brush things under the rug and and not talk about it you know like let's highlight it let's talk about it and let's fix it and let's move on from it you know um i, I think when pe people were talking I, I would hear people say well that doesn't that doesn't happen in the UK really or you know that's an American thing oh my god but that we have forms of it at home and we need to address that and yeah. it needs to be spoken about and it needs to be fixed um and yeah me sharing that experience was like I said just an expression of please let's be kind to each other and let's just understand we're all in this together we're yeah. all humans <laughs> Yeah. We are all, what did Prince say? We're doing this thing called life. Like, like let's just get through it together. Um, yeah. That's what that was about. Really. Yeah, it, well, it was beautiful. <clears throat> and, and, and thank you for, for sharing it. Cause I'm, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure it wasn't easy. And, you know, we, we've had some, um, some really brilliant conversations on the podcast. Uh, one being with David Harewood, who came on recently and, and, uh, you know, it was a deeply moving episode and I, I mean, we're, we're both sort of in tears at one point because, you know, he he was sort of talking about the impact that racism had had on him growing up and and how it had contributed to his psychosis and um, and obviously how it sort of informs your thinking and how you move through the world. And I wonder <clears throat> how it's impacted you growing up and 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 how you've sort of gone about your business and and your thinking. How how has it impacted you? I mean, for me, um, you know, my dad is black, my mom is white. So I have very different experiences on different levels. It's very complex. Um, the issues that I've been through myself, um, being judged in different spaces. So the issues for me are, are complex. Um, but what I would say is that I have two amazing 
role models in my life my mom and my dad have shown me what it is to live harmoniously no matter what color you are so I I always had that support they're still together now after you know 30 something years of, of being together so I've had these tremendous role models so you know, as what the the outside world naturally, you're going to be subjected to a lot of different things. But always, when I was home, I was safe. I was in an environment of lots of different color, lots of different diversity. I grew up in London, so you know, I I just I always felt safe and I felt celebrated a lot. But there were dark times like that time that I shared with my, my, my dad where I walked into the store and, and we experienced racism um, or, or, you know, different phases in my life where I had experienced racism. But the foundation for me was to always lean into to the positives in my life, which were my mom and dad and my family, my diverse family, that I feel like I had the best upbringing because of that. Mm. It's so important. I think if you've got solid foundations at home, you know, that is the best gift that that parents can give us growing up as kids. And I mean, you're living proof of that right now. And I'm imagining that. Well, I mean, I, I know from having watched certain things on the TV that they are immensely proud of what you've done and, and what you're still doing now. And it's been is it 15 years since you won the X Factor. It's yeah, it's been 15 years. It's mad. Not- it's so wild like it's I feel like it's a lot has happened but it's also gone so quickly mm-hmm. and I can't believe that 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 much time has actually passed since since the show I um, can't yeah it's wild <laughs> and I watched it and it feels like that wasn't that long ago and then when I was looking through the notes today I was like 15 how is that how is that possible it's so mad and it's so interesting because I mean, I experienced that world for about four seconds because a thousand years ago, I presented Extra Factor for like one series because I was not a match made in heaven. But (laughs) but I experienced it and I was sort of just taken aback by the whole thing because it is just the most surreal experience. And the filming hours are absurd. Like we would start filming at sort of seven in the morning and finish at like 11 or midnight and then try and get some sleep. But then people sort of singing in the corridors or playing piano, sort of nightmare. And, and then you're up and doing it all again the next day. And I wonder how, how did you handle that? That is such a gear shift from a regular life to then go into that just crazy whirlwind. How did you cope back then? Yeah, it was insane. Um, and, you know, we all moved into a house together as well, which was so crazy. Just being in a house full of people that you don't know, you're suddenly living with them. Nightmare. But also like in a competition, it's so weird. <laughs> It was, it was very crazy, but um, I just like, I knew what I wanted. I, for a long time, I'd, you know, been recording. I had an album, like an EP that I did um, before entering as well. So I knew that I wanted to be a recording artist. I knew I wanted to get my music out there. And I saw this as an opportunity to, to do that. Um, And when I first entered, I really didn't think that I would get very far, you know, I didn't know if these shows were real or if they picked the person before, like I had all those kind of theories. And then I realized as I went further that it, no, this is real. Like I could actually maybe have a, have a chance, have a shot at it. So um, yeah, I just, it was a surreal experience, but I, I just enjoyed the moments where I was on stage. I enjoyed the moments of creating um, the the backing tracks, or I think w- w- one week uh, we sang with a big band that I'd never ever done before in my life. So that was amazing. So I just enjoyed those moments and everything else around it. I kind of think I was just in a bit of a, a daze with it almost, you know, being on live TV, being in front of millions of people. And then that was when kind of YouTube, oh, I'm aging myself now, but that was when like YouTube was getting huge. So then I, my videos were being watched by people internationally. It was very wild. Um, But yeah, just, I would not ever change it. It was, 
an incredible place for me to to be and to to start this um this path I guess and then what about winning because you know people we're, we're sort of I guess indoctrinated to some extent to go you win something life complete you've nailed it you've smashed it you've won you couldn't get any better but it but is it that simple or is it actually quite overwhelming or much more complicated than than that how how was that experience I mean my dream was to ha have an album out to to reach as many people to get my music out there but I learned that you have these goals you reach them but then there's always something else there's always so something else. there's always something else you know so yeah it was a learning experience for me for sure um and you know once you're out there you can't then kind of not be out there so it was kind of an all or nothing thing in a way um but you know that from the show I I remember I went into promo and then I released my album and then I had a tour so I was doing all these incredible things and and really kind of living what what I wanted to do and and I never thought I'd get the chance to do it but I did and what about that element of then being out there because as you said earlier you know and from the outside, you seem like someone that's got a really good balance of, you know, you can do your job and you'll go out and do the, this big career, but actually you're quite reserved and private and you have to, you know, you yeah. hold things back for you. How, how did you juggle that? Because it's almost like you don't have a choice in that initial bit where you're like, you go on Lorraine the next day, then you're off on tour, then you're doing an album thing, then you're back on the X Factor. There's very little space to put a boundary down to say, I'm not willing to do that or put myself out there. So how did you navigate that? Yeah, and it's interesting because at first I would just do anything, everything. I'm there. I'm here for it. I'm I'm just gonna do everything I can. And at a certain point, I remember. I think I was on the road for like three years, <clears throat> and I was just like a zombie. And I started feeling ill. I, I didn't feel like myself. Um, and, and I remember I, I had to just come home and just have a moment. And um, I think what really was the tipping point for me, I, I did a, um, a musical on Broadway. Um, I did Cats. Uh, and I had a point where I got so, I was doing so much. I was doing so much. Um, and I got really sick. Um, and I literally woke up in the middle of the night. I felt like someone had had their hands around my throat and was like strangling me. And I shot up out of bed and I was kind of like, what is going on? And I started panicking. And um, eventually I found out that um, I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is something that affects the thyroid. So I probably had this for years and years and years kind of building up, but I never kind of noticed it or, or paid attention to it so clearly I was just doing too much um and one night it was like okay that's it <laughs> this you can't you can't do this anymore so um I really had to take note of my health and and check myself um and and really kind of get myself in a better mental place as well um and I feel like that kind of health scare like settled me down a bit and, and made me realize that, okay, there's certain things that I can't do. I can't do everything. Um, and I need to really take time for myself. And how, how did you deal with that? Because, you know, so often, whether you want to call it the universe or, or just life, it presents us with these kind of roadblocks, like, no, stop, halt. You know, yeah. I've had this, I've had this with mental health issues where I've had to eject myself from certain situations or stop for a period. And I've had to because there's no other choice, but it still doesn't sit well with me. I still then go, but I want to keep achieving. I want to keep reaching for the things I want to do. I want to feel like I'm in a creative flow. I want to feel like I'm getting somewhere. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but I, it never sits well with me. How do you handle have, like being forced to stop? Yeah, I think it's that thing that you said, where is it you want to get to? What is it? What is it that you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to have a peaceful life? Do you, are you trying to achieve 
I don't know, like success, money, fa- what what is it? Like what really matters to you? And I took into account what, what really mattered to me. I want to feel peaceful and calm um, uh, because my um, autoimmune condition is triggered a lot by anxiety and stress. So I really have to just calm myself down. I have to take a lot of time where I'm just on my own as well. I like, I know now that like, even as, as a kid, like I didn't have like a thousand friends. I remember like I had like one best friend, <laughs> like that's it because I can get drained a lot by being around a lot of people. It's, it can be very draining for me. So I now know that I need to take myself out of certain situations and just be on my own. Um, and you know, you kind of learn that as you, you get older, like I'm, I'm still learning, but now I know kind of what are my no's and what am I, okay, I can do this, you know, and, mm-hmm. and kind of putting boundaries on things and, and healthy boundaries as well, because sometimes it's hard to say no to things. I'm the kind of person that, you know, I, I grew up in, in a household that was like, you know, like we need to earn and work and, you know, need to make your way. And, and that I still have that mentality now. Like I want to take every opportunity because I don't know what's coming tomorrow or am I going to get that chance again? So I have that inbuilt in me. Um, so that's something I, I have to deal with a lot. I don't think you'll ever lose that. I have that too. I, I come from the, you know, the, the same sort of household where my mum had three jobs and my dad, you know, worked, he only retired last year. And and it's hard. I don't think you ever lose it. If that's been your your foundation in life I think it's always there and you just have to kind of work with it and you know and and set those boundaries but but it is tricky you know you're totally speaking my language here I I am an introvert weirdly I love communicating with people and I love decent conversation but I have to retreat I have to have time alone I need to be in bed early with a book with no one near me because I feel like I'm like regenerating during that time I have to be on my I have to go for walks on my own and but it's funny isn't it because on a societal level we're not really given much space to do that without there being a bit of aggro because you know we'll we'll get invited invariably you know this Christmas to however many Christmas parties you'll have your work Christmas party your mates you know your neighbor whatever I don't like parties I I don't like them like at all I don't like them (laughs) I, I don't mind my own birthday thing. I can deal yeah. with that because I've curated it, but I don't like other people's parties <laughs> and I can't be asked with them. But there's so little space to go, it's all right that you don't want to go to that. You know, you're seen as a sort of a flake or you're always, you know, there was one person that I know that always had these big parties and I got invited to one. And I was like, oh my God, this is so overwhelming, but I've showed up, I better stay for a bit. I felt highly awkward. I was trying yeah. to sort of like drink a cocktail to feel a bit more relaxed. So I didn't really feel like I was in it. And I just didn't get invited again afterwards. And it was like, <laughs> you know what? That was probably a good thing. But there's there's little space for people that don't like being in that sort of world and, yeah. and speaking to people. There's there's just not room for it. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, after a while, you just won't get invited to stuff. So right. it, then they make the choice for you. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because I I I just need a balance. I know when I get to that place where I'm like no, I don't want to go out. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to see anyone. I know that, okay, I, I need to just, like you said, regenerate, have time for myself and, and that's it. Um, but you know, there's also, it's, I, I also sometimes need that energy of kind of being around people. Um, and that's good because my husband actually balances me out because he's quite out there and kind of wants to do everything and see everyone. And so, if I get too kind of in my stuck in my ways, he'll kind of pull me out of my shell a bit, which is good. Yeah, that's so good because my husband's the same as me. So we are fucked. <laughs> We're not going to see anyone. That's it. <laughs> it's so sad. We sometimes go, gosh, should we do something? Like we're, we're just sort of, but we just love being at home and we love being. But that's okay. Like, yeah. That- that is fine like that's okay like be so. home be quiet like why is there such an emphasis on you have to be doing everything and seeing everyone and you don't like living just, your best you, life I hate yeah that. my best life is in my pajamas like with my 
with my dogs on the couch like yeah. that's my best life <laughs> like, that is that is so my that is my absolute best life I've got no time for all of that and also I'm 40 I did all that crap back in the day like t- yeah. I did it so like in the most full-on way that I'm yeah. I can put it to bed and I just need to deal with like the social repercussions but that's for me to deal with um <laughs> but it's good I think it's good to speak to other people that you know whether you you know call yourself an introvert or not it doesn't matter but it's certainly that feeling of you need to regenerate and it is interesting because you'll speak to some people and they need to constantly be around people because that's they are you know they feed yeah. off it or with the energy it's a sort of a, a, a sort of a cycle I guess of energy that you get from others I certainly need a bit of that and I get loads of it with my work I'm very lucky but the retreat bit oh so important yeah it's true and I I definitely I, I definitely have introvert tendencies, I would call it for sure. Yeah. Um, and you, you do, you need that time for yourself um, and you need to, to regenerate and kind of give yourself space to breathe and to, to hear your own thoughts or to just, you know, kind of, yeah, just be with yourself, sit with yourself. Yeah, we, we have to make space for it. Otherwise, I think that's, you know, they're probably the times when you don't do that. They're the times where you do feel a bit lost because it's so easy to get swallowed up by the, just the crazy, relentless noise of, you know, phones and screens and yeah. whatever else is going on that if you don't have a bit of time just with yourself, you you wonder, you know, well, what do I think anymore or like or want to do or whatever? I think it's important. Yeah, you get so like influenced by so many outside things. Um, And yeah, oh my God, it's so important to just have time for yourself. But it's hard because the world is so fast paced. People are moving on so quickly. Things are happening so quickly. Technology is developing so fast. Like keeping up with everything is difficult. Um, And yeah, sometimes you kind of, it's important to take yourself out of that. And I guess that brings me back to Hopefield and, and being in nature, being with animals. Like, it just feels so natural to be in that environment. Yeah. And I think that's why I'm surrounded by a lot of animals. Like, I've got four dogs. I've had goats and just all sorts, sheep, everything at, at my house. And and I just love it. I It's just, I don't know, very calming, very grounding to be around nature for me. Well, it's what we we all should be doing. Like, you know, I said to, this is this is a bit absurd, but I said to my husband the other night because I was feeling super overwhelmed because I've had a lot of really cool work stuff happening, but also, you know, it's just been full of and the kids and the parents WhatsApp group and oh god blah blah. And I just said, this is not realistic to live in the modern world. I said, I sometimes feel like a sort of Victorian person that's been thrown into 2021. Like, c- cope with that. Off you go. Here's a phone. Here's a computer. Here's a diary that's packed out. Here's some WhatsApp groups. And I'm just like, oh, I'm Victorian. I can't deal with this. I don't know what any of this means. Like, that's how I felt yesterday. Like, all the things. It's, all the it's things. A lot. Yeah, it is a lot. And it's funny because, like you said, I'm I'm the same I have so much going on right now like I've come out of this pandemic with like nothing happening so I was scared to death about that but then so much is happening now and I'm so excited but then also really overwhelmed and it's such a mixture of emotions like dealing with it is yeah. is tough I know life is bloody bonkers in it especially now well, uh, I, um, I'm going to let you go and have some time to yourself and, and <laughs> soak up that alone time. Um, and it's, God, what a joy talking to you. I've loved this conversation. It's so nice to catch up with you. And so much love and luck with the tour and everything that you've got going on for the rest of the year. Thanks for having me. And I'm obsessed with that pink mic, by the way. It's so cool. It's so nice, <laughs> isn't it? And pink love phones, it. everything pink. <laughs>